Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon your sins, and set you free from them, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We offer up together the collect for today, the third Sunday of the Epiphany. We say, Holy Spirit, Jesus began his ministry of our heart. He said to us today that we who are Christ's body may set up our holy as he did. We the say Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, for one God, forever and ever. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Listen to the good news proclaimed in the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4, beginning from verse 14. Glory to Christ our Savior. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to, get to them, This day the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise Christ. Ihre mag alle stemmen stil, behalve i stem. And may I speak in the name of God, who is the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It is good to be here to be able to share a little bit of my faith with you by looking at the Gospel of St. Luke that, we, that I just read to you. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news and the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus is in Nazareth and is claiming to be the Messiah, the Anointed One. He's making present the Kingdom of God. But maybe not in a way that those present in the synagogue in Nazareth that morning has hoped for or expected. I read this wonderful little story some time ago about a couple that was walking out of church one Sunday morning. The wife said to the husband, did you see the strange hat that Mrs. Brown was wearing? 
No, I didn't, replied her husband. Ian Smith badly needs a haircut, doesn't he? Commented the wife. Sorry, I didn't notice, replied the husband. You know, James, said the wife impatiently, sometimes I wonder if you get anything out of church, going to church at all. People get different things out of going to church, depending, it would seem, on their hopes and dreams, their fears and expectations. I'm sure that we all expect something instead of nothing. But most of the time we have no idea what that something is. We do not really take the time to ponder and put into words what that something is. It does make me wonder about the power of expectation and what it means in the life of faith. Do we go to church to fulfill and confirm our own beliefs and ideas and assumptions? Or do we come ready and open to be surprised by God and how he reveals himself to us? I wonder what the expectation was of those who gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth almost 2,000 years ago. What did they come to hear and see? And what did they intend to do with that message? Because the congregation in Nazareth is not at all that different from our own congregations. When we hear and receive the word of God, we must decide. We must decide what that means for me and how and if it makes my life different. That is why we often have real anxiety about the demands of the gospel and the call and cost of discipleship. Because the word confronts us, it disturbs us, it challenges us. It puts a claim and a call on our lives that we sometimes do not want to receive or respond to. But we know that if Jesus' words are fulfilled in our hearing today, then we will have to change. Jesus invites us to change. No, he demands that we change. He demands that we change if we wish to be a part of this new world. This new world which he called the kingdom of God. This new world of justice and peace. This new world in which we need a new heart. In which we need to look at the world and at each other with the eyes of Jesus. And that new world that Jesus is proclaiming is not only good news for the poor, it is good news for all of us. All of us who dare to believe in a world that is full of love and hope and peace. All of us who are willing to make the presence of God real in our world, in the places in which we live, through sacrificial living. All of us, who with our words and deeds, dare in the words of Jesus to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a very well-known author and theologian, who at the cost of his own life defied the Nazis and the unspeakable suffering they caused, said the following, and I quote, The essence of optimism is that it takes no account of the present, but it is a source of inspiration, of vitality and hope where others have resigned. It enables a man to hold his head high. 
to claim the future for himself and not to abandon it to his enemy. Isn't that what Jesus is saying in our gospel this morning? Isn't that what we all are looking for? A future present with vitality and hope. Isn't that what, what the church is, the body of Christ, is founded upon? Because we share the mission of Jesus. He works through us, his mystical body. He gives all of us different gifts so that we can make present this day of the Lord, this year of the Lord's favor. Jesus empowers us to live out this mission of bringing good news to those who are trapped in despair and hopelessness. Setting free those chained in captivity, opening eyes that cannot see, and helping the oppressed and exploited to find a new life. So that we can establish the kingdom of God. And Jesus told us these things today because his church does them. The poor gain hope, whether it's their souls or their bodies that need nourishment. The captives are freed, whether they are prisoners in jail or in a mansion, or prisoners of addiction. The blind receive sight, whether it's eye surgery or the scales of prejudice and hatred that is falling of their eyes. The oppressed are set free, whether the oppression is from a fascist dictator or from chemical dependence. Jesus calls us to live this new reality because the Spirit of the Lord is also upon us. And we are called to do this today. We are called to do this now. And for many of us that is terrifying. Because it means that we as individuals, but also we as the church, as the body of Christ, are called to live with reckless love. And with radical action. And if we intentionally live with that reckless love and pursue that radical action, then people outside of these walls will see that the favor of the Lord is upon us. And as we grow in faith and hope and in love, announcing with our actions that the, Lord, the day of the Lord's favor is here, people will come and join us. Are we ready? What are we willing to do? How far down that path are we willing to go? Because we cannot be certain of where this path of abandonment to divine love will lead. What will happen along the way? But I promise you, I promise you that like St. Augustine, we will also discover, and I quote, that to fall in love with God is the greatest romance. To seek Him is the greatest adventure. And to find Him is the greatest human achievement. On this adventure we will not only discover ourselves and others, but we will find our true selves within the sacred heart of God. We'll discover what Jesus calls the pearl of great price, our value, our worth as beloved children of God with whose existence he is well pleased. So my friends, let us allow the Spirit of the Lord to work in us 
and with us and through us so that we too can declare the year of the Lord's favor because the Spirit of the Lord is upon us. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this current day, I see many people are in despair and concern and worry about life. But the message I see today is one of hope. You speak to us through the inspiration of your word. Help us to see how today's word may benefit and renew us. The meditations of our hearts and the words of our mouths have not always been a reflection of our love for you. Gracious Lord, we are sorry for the times when our words and actions have more often served our own needs rather than benefit others in your kingdom. Open our hearts to your leading and guide us to live in response to your grace. You forgive us and renew us. You give us our bread and the bountiful earth. And we deserve our praise and thanksgiving. Magnificent are your ways and gracious is your will. May the thoughts of our hearts and the words of our mouths give witness to your love for the world. We pray this in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is gracious, and His mercy endures forever. Father Almighty, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Save us out into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Fight the good fight of faith, and you may finish your course with joy and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, rest upon you and those whom you love and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Our recessional hymn is so free. Thank you.